<laughs> Imagine getting an Ishmael at 99. All right, good Shabbos, everybody. All right, Parashat Lech Lecha. Now, last week uh, with Parashat Noah, I spoke with you guys about chasing birds and how Noah had the different types of birds, the dove versus the raven. And how the raven was this dodgy bird and it represented the evil inclination. And so too, we need to be like Noah. Throw it out the ark. Throw it out of your life, out of your mind. Get rid of that evil inclination. Rather, do what he did with the, the good inclination was take the dove in, into himself. The good inclination is what we should fill ourselves with. Now, it seems that after last week's sermon, my son, Judah, over there, actually listened for once to the to the, to the board. Because this whole week, uh, we were able to go away a little bit, take a break, midweek break, and uh, to try and recover from the last two months of Elul and Tishri and all the festivals. And uh, while we were away, it was so nice to see a lot of nature outside the city. And we saw birds galore. But as soon as we arrived, the first thing Judah does when he sees the bird, he sees these two geese. I was like, oh, look at the beautiful geese. Meow. Starts chasing them. And we're running past all the units of all the other people that are there and looking at me like, you're, you're not a control your child. Kind of thing. And I was like, ah, it's just a bird. Right? So he finished chasing the geese. The geese fly away. What does he do? He turns around. He sees some other birds. How he does? They so start chasing the how he does? They start flying away. Next thing, what does he find? Luris. I'm still trying to pronounce the word luri. You can't get it right. We'll get there soon. And he starts chasing the luris around. And he's chasing all these birds. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, this is exactly what I preached last week, right? Yes, go, my son. Chase away the evil inclination. Get rid of it. Good job. Now, you'll imagine my surprise when I decided to read this week's parasha as well. Because in this week's parasha, we see Abraham do the exact same thing. And of course, it's my son's uh, it's his birthday parasha, right? Lech lecha. Abraham does the exact same thing. We've got the story of him chasing away these uh, birds of prey that came there during the covenant sermon. So today I want to look at that very verse, uh, that section of Abraham chasing away the birds, uh, the birds, and see what we can learn from Abraham chasing away the birds. So I want to get into some of the midrashim and some uh, more esoteric stuff today. So bear with me, and uh, hopefully we can learn a lesson from that. Because eventually, it will help us answer an age-old question, a question that I have heard many, many times here in our congregation. Why didn't Hashem allow the Messianic era to start when Yeshua was here 2,000 years ago? Why do we still have to wait? Like we are very impatient. So we're going to try and answer that question today based upon what happens in this week's parasha. So in the parasha, one of the, there's a lot going on in the parasha, but one of the big things that happens, of course, is the covenant of the pieces. So God says to Abraham, take for yourself either three of each of these animals or three or olds of these animals. Let's just say three for argument's sake, or three or old. Uh, take for yourself three, three calves. Take for yourself three goats, three rams, and three doves, or three or old of each. And split them in half. Cut them in half, put one this side, one that side, and I will walk between there and pass through it, and we will make a covenant. We'll cut a covenant with each other. So cut the animals, but the doves, however, the Torah tells us, the doves were not to be cut in half. You could just place them one this side and one that side. And God says, then I will pass through and we will seal a covenant. That must be the weirdest thing in the entire Bible. Cutting animals in half and walking between them. This and the fact that it's not just Abraham doing this, right? Abraham was pretty much asleep when this happened. God himself appears in what? A flame in a pot. Okay, don't know why. I'm not going to try and explain that today. But this whole ceremony that God's explaining to us here seems so deep, so esoteric, so beyond our understanding, out there, something in a, a different realm, actually, very weird and holy. And then the Torah adds one little verse, which seems completely superfluous, completely out of place. It says, since we're so up in the sky learning about this weird mystical procedure happening, it says, then birds of prey swooped down on the carcasses, and Abraham, Avraham, uh, Avram drove them away. Back to earth. We're talking about God appearing in between this covenant of pieces and all of a sudden telling us a bit some, about some of the housekeeping. Abraham decided to chase away these birds because they wanted to come eat some, uh, some offal. And then it goes back into more mystical, esoteric stuff again, where it talks about the terror of darkness that came upon Abraham. And God explains to him this prophecies of what will happen to his descendants. For 400 years, they will go into exile in Egypt. Okay, so let's talk about this birds that decide to come here and spoil the party. Birds of prey, good or bad? Maybe both. Last week, we looked at the bad element of it, right? We looked at the raven and how it's the evil inclination, and how actually it represents something bad. But this week, I want to look at the other element of the birds of prey, because Rashi actually tells us, I'm commenting on this verse, quoting the Midrash, that 
These birds of prey represent one of the most important people in biblical history. Rashi, quoting the Midrash, the Perkei, Rabbi Eliezer, says the birds of prey represent King David. I don't know how many of you would consider King David a bird of prey. Maybe a bird of governing prey, but not the prey that we're talking about over here. Eh? So the Midrash comes along and it bases this upon a verse from the Bible. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 9, uh, 12, verse 9 talks about my heritage. God says my heritage, which is also a reference to David and the Davidic kingship. God says in Jeremiah 12, verse 9, my heritage, David, is like a speckled bird of prey. Okay, so apparently these birds of prey that came down during the ceremony are representative of David or the house of David or the kingdom of David, right? Which begs the question then, if they represent David, why then is Abraham chasing away the birds of prey? Shouldn't we be welcoming the Davidic birds, right? Doesn't it represent the Messiah maybe or the throne of David? Why is he chasing it away? Or even more confusing is if you look at what the other animals represent. Anyone want to guess what the other animals represent? The ones that were actually cut in half and then also the doves. Let me read to you what the Midrash Rabbah says about those animals. Uh, so it says here, the Midrash offers an interpretation of this verse, according to which the verse alludes not to sacrifices, but to the various kingdoms that would conquer Israel in the future. Right? So each of these animals that were cut in half represents a different kingdom. First of all, uh, God says to Abraham, take for me three heifers, three cows. This alludes to Babylon, which established three kings, Nebuchadnezzar, the evil Merodach, and Belshazzar. Okay, so the cows, those are the Babylonians. What about the three goats? The three goats, this represents to the nation of Media, the kingdom of Media, which also established three kings, Cyrus, Darius, and Ahasuerus. And the three rams, the three rams, this alludes to Greece, and it gives us a proof text as to why it alludes to Greece. Okay, so it goes on to explain the reason why the larger animals represent the nations, because obviously they're larger than Israel. Whereas the dove and the turtle dove, what do they represent? They represent Israel. Okay, because it's smaller, it's more like a dove. And that's why the doves themselves don't get split in half, because it's not supposed to be, uh, not supposed to be torn apart. The doves represent Israel. Whereas the, the other animals, those are wicked nations that try and oppress Israel, they will one day be torn in half. Okay, got that. So I ask you the same question again. If that is the case, then why is Abraham chasing away the birds of prey? Because doesn't the birds of prey represent David coming and destroying, tearing apart the other nations that have always oppressed us. So this is what the Midrash, uh, the Midrash Perkei, the Rabbi Eliezer tells us. It says the following. It says this whole ceremony and the birds of prey coming there is symbolic that David will want to come and he will want to destroy the nations of this world. This is why the animals are torn in half. But God will not permit David to do it just yet. God will say to David, you are only allowed to do this when King Messiah comes. Not yet. This is what the Midrash says about what's going on here. So what happened here is that apparently Abraham, maybe in this prophecy that God showed him, because the Midrash also tells us God showed him all of human history from the beginning till the end, till the coming of Messiah. Maybe Abraham saw something that caused him to delay the process, to delay, to stop David from coming too early. Why did he do that? Don't we always say we should be asking for Mashiach now, Mashiach now? Why did Abraham try and delay the coming of David and Messiah until the final coming of Messiah? Well, I have to go to another famous Midrash to explain this to you guys. A Midrash we've quoted quite often in the past here. It tells us where does Abraham sit while we wait for the resurrection? He sits at the gates of Gehenna. Why does he sit at the gates of Gehenna? He's a bouncer. He's got a job. To check who goes into Gehenna and who doesn't go into Gehenna. And what does he do? Everyone that comes into Gehenna, he gives them a quick, uh, let's call it a, a doctor's check. And he checks if any of them have the marks of circumcision. If you have a bris milah, the Midrash says, you're Jewish, you don't belong in Gehenna. So Abraham says to you, no entrance, you're in the wrong place, go to the better place. This is how we see what, this is the, the, the Midrashic idea of what Abraham does. He sits there and if you're, uh, if you're a Jew, he doesn't allow you into Gehenna. Now, the Midrash actually gives us more background because the reason why he sits there is actually for, recorded for us in the account of the Midrash as well. The reason why Abraham is sitting there and stopping all the circumcised Jews from going into Gehenna 
is because in this week's parasha, when God shows him this vision, the Midrash tells us that God gave Abraham an ultimatum. He showed him the vision of his descendants. And he said to him, I am making this covenant with you and I'm giving you these promises. This land will be yours. Your children will be as many as the stars. But Abraham said, Hashem, what if my descendants mess up? What if they become sinners and they're not worthy of inheriting these promises? So God said to Abraham, I'm giving you a choice here and now. Either I can send them straight into Gehenna so they can be punished for their sins, or I can send them into exile, destroy their temple, destroy the holy city, and send them into exile. And Abraham had to choose either Gehenna for his children or exile for his children. Can you imagine making this choice for your children? If God had to actually give you the choice between these two, when your child messes up, which one of these is going to happen? So Gehenna is pretty much straightforward. Here comes the judgment. Now, there you go. You've messed up straight to Gehenna, burned for a few thousand years. Exile, I think this notice, it sounds a bit better, right? Exile, what does God do? He takes away the temple and he takes away our holy city and spreads us to all four quarters of the earth. And uh, this is represented in this week's parasha because the animals that we, we learned about in this uh, story of the covenant of the pots, remember last week with parasha Noah, we learned about clean and unclean animals. Here, it specifically only lists the animals that are allowed to be used in the temple itself for offerings. So what it's teaching us is that if we, Abraham's descendants, if we misuse the process of atonement that God has given us through his holy temple, then God will take it away by taking away his temple and sending us into exile. So the Midrash actually says, Abraham doesn't know what to choose. So he says, Gehenna. God says, no, don't choose Gehenna. Rather choose exile. Abraham says, I'll choose exile. <laughs> so Abraham had to phone a friend, apparently. He needed some persuasion from God. And because of that, this is why Abraham now sits at the gates of Gehenna as the bouncer. When he sees a Jew coming, he says to him, hold up, hold up, you are in the wrong address. You don't belong here. Don't choose Gehenna, rather choose exile. Why? Because if you choose exile, you still have a chance of repentance and turning back to Hashem. The final judgment has not yet come. You have a little bit more time before the final judgment comes. Uh, listen to uh, what the Midrash continues to say here. In... Uh, Verse 16, the Midrash says, Abraham, uh, Rav Asi says that Abraham took a staff. This is when he saw the birds coming. He took a staff and he struck these birds of prey, but the birds were not beaten. Nevertheless, the verse continues and says that Abraham drove away the birds of prey through teshuva, through repentance. So at first he tried to hit it with a stick and he saw the stick doesn't work. So what did he use? He used teshuva to try and drive away this bird of prey. How do we get to that? How do the rabbis uh, decide this? Well, because, if you hear the commentary, uh, the Midrash is expounding on the word that's used here where it says, Abraham, vayashev, when he chased or drove away the birds. Vayashev, says the Midrash, is related to the word teshuva, repentance. It's the root for the word repentance. So Abraham figured out that instead of them going straight again and having the final judgment there and then, he can use teshuva to delay the final judgment and give his descendants another chance at not ending up in Gehenna. Okay, wonderful little midrash. So, what's going on here? We're going to see the same thing happen in the life of King David himself. Let me take you guys to another covenant uh, section of the Torah. The Davidic covenant, which of course is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So, listen to this and see what David does here. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse, I'll start with verse 1 until verse 7. It says, after the king, David, had been living in his palace a while, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a cedar wood palace, but the ark of God is kept in a tent. I'm in a palace, but God's ark is in a tent. Nathan said to the king, go and do everything that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. So the Midrash explains to us, it says, what did David do? David said, I'm going to start building a house for God right now. So David went out there after, after Nathan gave him the go ahead and he started building. What did he start building? He laid the foundation for the Western Wall, says the Midrash. And this is why the Western Wall will never be destroyed. Even till today, the Western Wall is still standing. That's what the, one of the Midrashim said. 
Okay, I'm not going to get into that and uh, how that's possible, but it's very interesting. Because they say that if David built something, a house for the Lord, it must be eternal, cannot be destroyed. That is why the Western Wall still stands with us till today. Okay, so while David went out and started laying the foundations, verse 4, that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan and said to him, go and tell my servant David that this is what the Lord says. You are going to build me a house to live in? Since the day that I brought the people of Israel out of Egypt until today, I never lived in a house. Rather, I traveled in a tent and a tabernacle. Everywhere I traveled with all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word to any of the tribes of Israel whom I ordered to shepherd my people in Israel, asking them, why haven't you built me a cedar wood house? So Nathan had to run out that night after he gave David the okay, David started construction, and he had to go stop David from building the temple. He had to stop David from building the temple. Why? Why did God stop David from building the temple? Isn't this something we pray for three times a day in our Amidah? We're supposed to ask God to restore the kingdom of David and build the Davidic temple. For the same reason that Abraham stopped the Davidic birds of prey coming down and swooping down and eating the offerings as well. It's the exact same reason. The sages explain it as follows. If David was to complete building the temple in his day and age, that temple would have to stand forever. Because the Davidic covenant, what does the Davidic covenant say? It says, I'm establishing you with this covenant that your uh, royal throne will be established forever. Meaning that the temple cannot be destroyed if it's the Davidic temple, the messianic temple, the one we're all looking forward to, that Mashiach himself is going to come and build. Now, that sounds good, right? The temple of Messiah, the temple of David, that should stand forever. That sounds like something good, something we should be seeking. But the problem is what happened with the agreement God made with Abraham. Remember, he said to Abraham, if your descendants mess up, instead of taking them and punishing them, rather I will take the temple as a mashkon, as a pledge in their place, and I will send them into exile. I will not bring judgment upon them just yet. I will first bring judgment upon my own house, and they will have a chance to come back and do repentance. But if the temple was built by David, we would be sitting with a problem. Then God would have to destroy Israel, send them all straight to Gehenna. So God had to delay the full final judgment and the final redemption. In both of these stories, the one with Abraham chasing away the birds of prey, and so too with David when he wanted to build the temple. And God had to quickly tell Nathan, hey, go stop him before it's too late. And this is the exact same thing as to why we understand the first and second coming of Yeshua. This is why Yeshua at his first coming had to give up his life for us instead of initiate the messianic era right then and there. <coughs> Defeat Rome, build the temple. There's a problem. Because if Messiah started the messianic era right then and there, where would your soul be today? You would never have known about the one true God. You would have never have known about the Messiah. You would never have experienced his salvation. So what Yeshua did was that he provided us with atonement and he provided us with time to repent instead of bringing the immediate final judgment back then 2,000 years ago. And he extended this invite beyond just Abraham's physical seed and physical descendants. He extended it to his spiritual descendants as well. Gentiles who have come to faith. Sons of Abraham's by faith. This is why Paul says in Romans 11:25. Talking about uh, the Jews being blinded for a moment. He says it's happened so that the fullness of the Gentiles may enter. It's a huge, huge, huge gift that God has given to the whole world. Do not sending the final judgment 2,000 years ago when Yeshua was here. It's a big concept to actually consider. But where does that leave you today? Because the final judgment is still coming. It will come. It's coming. Someday we're going to run out of time, right? So that day that that happens, these birds of prey are going to return after Abraham shoot them away. And when that happens, there's going to be a big buffet for these birds of prey. Let me read to you what happens in the final great wars that's going to happen. Ezekiel chapter 39 tells us about the war of Gog and Magog and what's going to happen then and there. Let me read to you from 39 verse 1. Ezekiel 39 verse 1. It says, so you human being, Prophesy against Gog. Say that Adonai Elohim says, I am against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, 
I will turn you around, lead you on, and bring you from the far reaches of the north against the mountains of Israel. But then I will knock your bow out of your left hand and make your arrows drop from your right hand. You will fall on the mountains of Israel, you, your troops, and all the peoples with you. I will give you to be eaten up by all kinds of birds of prey and wild animals. You will fall in the open field, for I have spoken, says Adonai Elohim. Let me read to you again in verse 17. So it goes on to explain how many of them will die. There will be so many dead bodies that will actually have to appoint people to go and put flags everywhere they find a human bone. To say, hey, we have to come cleanse this place so we can cleanse uh, Jerusalem and Israel so we can build the final temple. That's how many dead there will be. In fact, we'll call the place Hamona, which means multitude of all the dead. So verse 17, he says, back to the uh, bird imagery. As for you, human, Adonai Elohim says that you are to speak to all kinds of birds and to every wild animal as follows. And say to them, assemble yourselves and come, gather yourselves from all around for the sacrifice that I am preparing for you. A great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel where you can eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat flesh of heroes and you will drink blood of the earth's princes, rams, lambs, goats, bulls, fatted in Bashan, all of them. You will eat fat till you are gorged and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrifice that I have paid for you. At my table, you will be satiated with horses and horsemen, heroes, and every kind of warrior, says Arunai Elohim. So then the birds will come back at the final judgment when everyone's been given their judgment and people that deserve death have been granted death by Hashem. This is why in Luke chapter 17, some of the apostles and some of the uh, Pharisees ask Yeshua, when will the kingdom come? And what does Yeshua say? We read it last week. He says, it will be like in the days of Noah. It will be like in the days of Lot. People will be going on doing whatever they please, right? And Yeshua says, and then all of a sudden, one will be plowing and one will be left behind. One will be sleeping in the bed and the other one will be left behind. That's the whole story, right? This is the whole left behind story. And Yeshua ends off by saying, wherever there is a dead body, that is where the vultures will gather. So Abraham, David, and Messiah have done us a great favor by chasing away these vultures momentarily instead of bringing the great final judgment already for us so that you and your soul have a chance of repentance, a chance to make it in to the Messianic era as well. This is why Abraham chased away the Davidic birds. This is why Hashem allowed Yeshua to be crucified instead of bringing that final great day and messianic era. But the day is still ahead of us. It is coming. This is a lesson for us. We've been granted an extra chance. God has given us extra time. So use your time wisely. Or else you'll end up eating crow. Shabbat shalom.